Hey everyone, this is Craig. Before we get going today, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for listening. Over the last three years, I've worked really hard to bring you the art world conversations I would want to hear. That's led to conversations with the likes of Shepard Ferry, Wolfgang Tillmans, Tony Craig, Sharon Nashat, William Kentridge, along with dozens of other artists, curators, authors, critics. I've been fortunate enough to have Canvia as the sponsor of the podcast. It's enabled me to create all this great content without having to point anyone to a payment platform. That being said, if you'd like to do me a favor, you can stop what you're doing right now and rate and review the podcast. I know it sounds trivial. I know it sounds weird, but you'd be surprised how that one metric helps a world of new listeners find us. That's it. That's all. Enjoy the episode. This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I have the honor of speaking with the legendary art critic, Roberta Smith. For nearly five decades, Roberta has been a guiding force in the art world, shaping conversations and perceptions with her incisive critiques and unparalleled insights. From her early days working alongside Donald Judd to her illustrious tenure at the New York Times, Roberta's journey through the ever-evolving landscape of contemporary art offers a unique perspective on the intersection of creativity, criticism, and culture. In the conversation, we delve into Roberta's remarkable career, exploring the challenges and triumphs of navigating the art world's intricacies as well as gathering insights into how she crafts her acclaimed reviews and essays. In addition, we'll explore the dynamic interplay between art and life, as Roberta shares her experiences as a partner to fellow art critic Jerry Saltz. Together, they form a powerhouse couple whose passion for art reverberates through their personal and professional lives. And now, a conversation about criticism, passion, and one iconic person's journey through the art world with Roberta Smith. Roberta Smith, thank you so much for joining me this week on the Art Sense podcast. Roberta, uh, there are very few people on my podcast that probably don't need any introduction. But ju just for formality, I'll, I'll say that, Roberta, you are, have recently stepped down from your post as co-chief art critic for the New York Times, uh, a title that you've held since 2011, an organization you've been involved with for nearly 40 years. Roberta, you know, I don't normally go chronologically in, in a conversation with someone, but I would love to start with as far back as you can think of in terms of, do you recall a first art experience that you had there in the outskirts of Kansas City? Uh, I, I recall a couple of aesthetic experiences. I don't know if it was art, but the sense that things could have a kind of presence. And one of them was being inside my aunt's Mercedes Benz. And I suddenly realized that there were grades of things, that some things were better than others just by being the best they could be in their own category. And that that was like a, a revelation to me. You know, I hadn't really been thinking that way. I mean, I was, I don't know what I was, probably around 10. And then another time when I was even younger, the same aunt actually had a, a dairy farm in Virginia and this great old house. And, you know, it was in Northern Virginia, so we're not talking plantation scale or anything like that. It was full area with dairy farmers and uh she had this this living room and i was going in there to see my mother my grandmother who was sick and i had never been in the room before and i stepped into the room and she had an intensely bright green carpet you know like right across the entire floor with very little furniture most of it pushed against the walls and that was just that gave me such kind of pleasure and I think it started my understanding of, you know, like, that, I mean, I, I considered it in a way my first reading, Rudolf Stingle, 
you know, who, who does these carpets, carpet pieces. But it was just a thrill again. You know, then I remember we went to we went to Europe when I was eight on a Fulbright, and my my mother had never been to Europe, so we were dragged all over the place. And I can't say that I actually remember a lot of what I say. I mean, we went everywhere, and uh, but I loved it, and I loved Europe, and you know, just the kind of the mass of art that we were visiting. I probably remember remember cathedrals and cla castles and structures more than abso absolutely paintings. I think I was maybe a little young to focus on them. But um, there have been some things. And then my mother was always very much like, don't you want to major in art? I don't know why she got this idea, whether it was a frustration of her. I, you know what? I don't think I've ever heard that. I don't think I've ever heard that someone's parents asking, don't you want to major in art? Well... You know, I grew up at the University of Kansas, and she took she took art history courses, and there was a very pretty good small museum there that then expanded to the Spencer. But um, so she was sort of involved with different things like that, and you know, I ended up actually majoring in art at I went to Grinnell College, but they didn't really have anybody teaching art history, so I kind of emerged toward the end of that program. I was beginning to realize like. What am I going to do, you know, with this? I'm not going to, I know I'm not an artist. And I was lucky. I had this very hip art professor. I didn't know his name was Richard Servine. He was born in Iowa, went to Grinnell, taught at Grinnell, and was sort of closeted, but flamboyantly so. And he was, he kept up on e everything that happened in New York, the shows, the exhibitions. And one thing he found out about was the Whitney Independent Study Program. The first semester, which is like early in 1968 at some point. And he sort of grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and said, you are applying for this. And I said, I was like, who, me? And, and then I said, well, if I get into, I have to go. And he said, most definitely. So that was sort of the most terrifying moment of my college. I mean, I was just, I was so afraid. Of, and I got to New York and it was scary. I was so scared that I never, you know, I had, I wasn't called Roberta until I got there because I was too scared to tell people that actually I had this other name. And it was like, okay, I'm not going to go against this. And, um, it was just very kind of transformative. I got a new name. I And I just, the minute I got there, I started just loving everything about New York. So I, I w was taken on the subway when they still had rattan seats. That was one of the first things I did. And I was just like, wow, you can be with all these strangers. <laughs> you know, you can, the whole world is around you and you can watch and you can participate as you need to. But it was just, it seemed very, just marvelous. And then the point of the independent study program was to sort of get you into the art world. So we had seminars with different people and we did a, the art people who were far outnumbered by the studio people worked on a paper. And I had chosen, um, you, that was part of your application. So I had proposed doing an article on minimalism with Donald Judd. And I think my only memory of that was like Hilton Kramer's, we took the Sunday Times and I remember an image of one of uh, Judd's big frame pieces at the Whitney. And, you know, I, so I knew a little bit about him. So, and when I got to New York, he wasn't interested in that at all because he absolutely had no interest in minimalism. He had no interest in my proposal, which was to relate his work to like ancient monuments and finally, I just realized I should do a, a paper on him and specifically on his development from two to three dimensions, which was only like 10 years in the rearview mirror because um, this was the fall of 68. And so I did that and I just kind of, you know, I went to galleries and I would have interview him periodically or follow him out to the fabricator or to an installation somewhere. And I came back, I wrote 
a paper about it. It had never been written on, really. And the minute I graduated, I just went straight back to Grinnell, back to New York. My mother said, don't you think you could go to Chicago? <laughs> I said, no, <laughs> there's nothing like this anywhere. But I just, right. I, I just sort of got this. And what I got from being in the art world in New York was that artists are really in the minority. There are all these other people who have figured it, who, who have to be around art in some way. Many of them arrive as artists and then realize they're not artists. Jerry's one, you know, one of a long tradition. And that they they do things like they take photographs of of exhibitions or they frame things, or, you know. And behind these endeavors was always somebody who was still painting or doing something. And I just, I mean, of course, it was evidence that it was really hard to make a living in the art world. And the other thing I had done, I did that fall, was that I, I wanted to sort of do something for Judd or with Judd. So I proposed to him that I take all of his writing in arts. At that point, he hadn't written that much, mainly the reviews in Arts Magazine. And I would, I don't know how I even got this idea, but I would convert all of these reviews back into a single manuscript. Wow. So, and I used to, I, I had a job at the Modern and I would come home from work and sit down with my little Corona electric. And by the time I finished, I had 150 pages of single spaced reviews. And it was a completely painless way almost to absorb his writing, his attitude, sort of his vocabulary. And Absolutely. and to all and it's his his work at that point, you know, reviewing was very rudimentary, you know, just really talking about what was there and then delivering a judgment. Right. And if nobody's read them, I recommend it. But anyway. So let me ask you, you know, he grew up east of Kansas City, out in Excelsior Springs, Missouri. Right. Do you feel like you guys shared some sort of kinsmanship in terms of like where you came from regionally? Did you ever sense that? Or is that something you guys ever talked about? No. I mean, I think there was a kind of... Uh, other interviewers have, have made the, I mean, Jared Ernst once interviewed me and he brought up the whole idea of minimalism versus me being a Quaker. But I think all of that kind of figures in there, you know, that I sort of understood that there's a concept of space, I think you probably get in the Midwest. And I know that Judd would talk about looking, just looking at the landscape and talk about a, a, a series of white bluffs that went along one part of his it was his grandfather's farm. But, um, you know, he was very aware of that. And there were all kinds of ways that we intersected and didn't. I mean, I wasn't a genius and I wasn't a kind of repressive genius. So <laughs> once I, and I came around to thinking, well, painting probably isn't dead. You know, I mean, I came out of that situation, quit the modern, didn't work for Judd. I wanted to be a critic. And I was I was fairly well equipped. I had like the template from absorbing his stuff. And then it took me a while to not be a Juddite, you know, that oh, it's like, oh, yeah, painting's dead or, you know, this is. And I was confronted with a lot of conceptual art. So I had to sort of write about narrative more than I probably would have because there wasn't there really wasn't anything else. And. I don't know, I just started writing and learning. And uh, I sort of worked my way up the ladder of art magazines. I started at Arts, which was completely the bottom, which is no longer exists. And the thing I learned is that most art magazines were desperate for reviewers, so they would give anyone a try. You couldn't, you, you, it wasn't hard to get your foot in the door. What's really hard was doing it for your life you know, doing it as the central activity of your life. And that's that's what I wanted to do. Criticism was kind of a little side route that people would take, you know. Sheldon wanted to be a poet. Lucy Lepard wanted to be a novelist. And so I thought, oh, I'm just going to concentrate on doing this one thing. I'm going to try to make my living off of it. And I'm going to try to do it 
for my whole life. You know, which which meant I I was going to do, I wanted to stay sort of fresh and open, and I didn't want to de- develop what what I saw as various degrees of ideology. I mean, I know I have my own, but you know, we all do to some extent. Right. But um, mine, at least, was about art. As it, you know, I I'm just really interested in what artists do at any given right. point in time how they deal with what's behind them, how they affect what's in front of them. I, I read somewhere that your your first foray came as a letter to the editor at Art Forum regarding a Donald Judd uh, review or article. Yeah. And that it was it wound up being a ten page letter that you wrote to the editor. And you know, you it's probably best for you to tell the story, but you know, about how the, the person responded and said, you know, if you could cut this down you could cut this in half. <laughs> Right. And so and it just struck me, what, you know, a 10 page letter doesn't sound like the R- Roberta Smith that we, we typically think of. No, I had no, I was somebody, my first writing experiences or experiences of my own writing was writing voluminous letters home, you know, that basically could have gone on forever, would be a, you know, single space. So I, I can't even remember. Robert Pincus Whitney wrote the article. It was an art forum. It was when I was still working at the Modern. So it was kind of early in my time in New York. And I just I just think I had a degree of unbridled ambition that I wasn't very conscious of, you know. And I was very territorial about Judd, obviously. And so I just, he, he compared Judd to the constructivist, I think. I should read it again at least his writing. Um, and I just took off. I mean, I barely even knew anything about constructivism. I just, I don't know what made, I think, I think it was just kind of feisty and he must have liked that. And then Pinkus Witten responded. And I remember he used words like egregious, which I didn't quite understand. <laughs> but, you know, I just, I would just go, you do these things when you're really young and you don't quite, unless you're incredibly sensitive and self-aware, you don't quite understand what you're doing and and you don't understand the repercussions, just how you are entering the art world. Luckily, Pink has written a few years later, invited me to to write reviews. So, um, but yeah, that was, well, the, Basically, I I was working for a curator at that time, and I showed her my letter before it had been sent. And she said, well, you know, you could be a critic. And that was like the first time it had ever been specified. And then she said, I'll send this to Phil Leader, you know, the mythical editor of Art Forum, with a cover letter, which she did. And then a, a letter came back that began, this is a really obnoxious way for someone who wants to be a critic to start out, but she cuts <laughs> it in half, blah, blah. So that is like within a very short period of time, that idea had been, you know, highlighted. And I just sort of took it because I knew that I was interested in opinion and I was interested in looking and there I knew I didn't want to work in a museum. It was just too hierarchical. And I didn't want to, it just seemed like a place where I could sort of do my work and be told, you know, under the direction of certain, of editors. And I would emerge from it with a body of work. So that's when I went to arts and they said, sure, here's a list (laughs) of galleries. And um, it's very strange to look at, back on your life and see how things happen and I was just very lucky you know and I think I had a certain the thing that I I think I've always had is a kind of voice I mean Jerry is another writer like that um that regardless of what I'm saying there's a certain tone that gets your attention you know you you may lose their attention when they don't like your writing but there's a tone of I will say authority you know, because I had a certain belief in my opinions. I, I didn't know what was going to happen. But then I got, you know, I got kicked out of the art world, sort of. Well, I got, Pete, when Peter Sheldahl went to The Voice in like 
80 or 79 or something, I went there to see if I could get like a second critic position. And for a while, there were other critics sort of writing, you know, below Peter, like three or four of us. And then at a certain point, I think they decided that I was I was the one. And um, once again, you don't know. You don't know like other people are writing. I don't quite realize I'm in competition with them. Do you know, it's just, I mean, I, I think I felt my way along probably more than most people who come into the art world. I was, I was definitely a late bloomer, do you know? How did you find that voice of authority being a, a, a 20 something female in a boys club in a new world? Where did that confidence come from, Roberta? Well, I think partly it probably came from reading Judd that, that criticism was basically a kind of declarative practice, if you will. And that writing for magazines was also an act of compression that you tried to get to say what you wanted in as few words as possible. It was like taking bricks out of a wall and not having the wall collapse. Um, and I also, not to point out to my personal life, but I also think that my father was a writer, my grandfather was a writer, you know, my, my father was a geographer, so was his father. His father evidently wrote textbooks without, you know, just kind of recited them to stenographers. But there was writing, and my father had this really weird, special way of talking. I don't know, it was kind of academic, it was probably from Quakers. And so when I wrote letters, I was trying to be amusing as well. So I just think I got very much in the habit of talking about things that were happening to me, you know, and making them sound amusing. And, you know, I sort of carried that. I mean, I think that my basic style of reviewing is I walked into a gallery and this is what I saw and describing it in detail and having an opinion about it. And the implication is you too can do this. You know, you just walk in, you're gonna start looking around, see if what, see if anything I said makes sense. And I mean, I, I think I'm very reader oriented. Like I wanna say, this is fun. This, you'll get something out of seeing this. This is a terrible show, but you should see it, you know? Right. And the thing that was so great for me was when I started writing for The Voice, a friend of mine had said, if you want to be a critic, you've got to get out of the art world and get a readership. And that was the great gift of writing for The Voice, because all of a sudden I was in print the same time the art I was writing about was on view. They could test the usefulness of my work. Did it have use value? And I, I really wanted it to have that. I wanted it to help people in some way. That cut through a lot of unnecessary stuff for me. I didn't write anymore thinking about what Judd would think or anybody else. I just wrote thinking, as I would always say to Jerry when he was first writing, I said, what does the reader need to know now? Like you get to the bottom of your first graph. What does the reader need to know now? Do you talk about the show? Do you say how many works are in the show? Do you break off and talk about the artist? You know, just these are kind of mechanical things, but they are, they're a, an elastic a format, if an elastic one, that I think most critics adhere to in some way. You know, and sure. people are reading you for information, for your opinion, and for a certain brevity, I think. And that that worked well with writing for The Voice and worked well at the times because we're just, you know, space is premium in the, when you're on newsprint. And even when we go digital, it's still premium. They don't want to like put too much on the screen uh, and overwhelm people. You, you're, you're talking about when Jerry first started writing. You know, a lot of times I'll talk to artists and a lot of artists wind up teaching and they, they talk about how going through the process of teaching makes them better artists. Just saying the words out loud challenges them to uh, be who they say this person should be. 
in the process of knowing Jerry as he evolved into a writer, did you find yourself saying things out loud and kind of figuring out that you were almost teaching him in a way and that in some way kind of reflected back on how you were approaching your own work? Yeah, I mean, I helped Jerry. When Jerry was first uh, doing this, I I helped him start pieces. I helped him get what, what we call the top of a review. And then sometimes I never... I never read what he wrote, but I would talk him through certain points or I would, I, I would like talk about, a, you know, like the first four sentences of a piece, how, you know, you shouldn't be up there doing this. You should be right down here, two line, two sentences in doing it, you know, and that'll come in later. Um, so, but, you know, there was a certain point at which Jerry, i never talked to him about this, but he found something, something kind of volatile in him and he was able to just start writing from his own psychological responses and also admirably jerry was very aware of educating himself when he was going through this you know stepping from one publication time out to the voice to new york magazine he was reading an intense amount of poetry he was really educating himself in poetry which I sort of, everything I do is sporadic. I put the, I pick things up and put them down. And he's just like, okay, now I'm going to be reading, you know, starting with Homer, you know, and just going forward. And, you know, at a certain point, he's at Milton, you know, and that was stunning for me to watch that. I mean, I kept thinking, why, why can't I do this? You know, why can't I stick this way? <laughs> so it was very, I found it very self-incriminating for a while, but he has this kind of poetic voice, I think, of, of like just setting off and talking about things sort of much more abstractly than I'm interested in talking about them. He really wants to talk about what art did to his insides. And I touch on that, but more I'm interested in explaining how my insides got touched by these specific details, why it looks this way and why I might fit it in the kind of ongoing stream of art history. I've seen Jerry post photos online before of a legal pad where he's been taking notes while going through an exhibit. And it's just cram full of not even notes. It's just like words. It's almost like a poet grabbing words that he's going to piece back together later. He doesn't ever go through exhibitions with legal pads. He would go through exhibitions sometimes with a checklist, but he'd spend a great deal. He'd start with a, first, a few words and he'd look up synonyms. And he'd uh, look up different things, different ideas that he had, and kind of build a vocabulary of how to talk about this thing. You know, it came kind of organically, but it came slowly. I mean, I would see him hunched over a dictionary, you know, hours on end, or, or also he read catalog essays. But it was a very interesting process that he, he thought and he, he, that he could, and he actually did put this thing together, that he could start with this kind of inchoate response and figure out a vocabulary. And, you know, and then he'd just sort of be off and rolling down toward the end of the piece. I was like stuck here looking at, like I would spend two days working on my top paragraph, you know, and moving the first four paragraphs around and trying to figure out to get one thing to fun. And so on the day of the deadline, it was like, okay, time to write the rest of the piece. And I would just kind of write the rest of the piece. It was really weird. Like my writing would get looser as you move down a piece because I had let go. But I, I think we sort of got to the same place, but I was never, I never had his kind of mythologizing, whatever you want to call it. Are, are you are you that person that has to have a deadline or it's not going to get done? That's a really good question to ask me in retirement. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I always thought that I'd never leave the Times, that I was so happy there and enjoyed it all, and that I'd go out feet first. And then with COVID, I started thinking about, well, COVID for me was a kind of like practice retirement, and I didn't like it. I kind of collapsed. Um, I can't be away from New York too much. Um, and then... It became more and a more possibility, a possible thing 
because I was my writing has slow, slowed down, which you can take as a sign of my age, or you can take as an indication that I'd like to go deeper in some subjects. Mm-hmm. Either way, it's fine with me, but I just wasn't, it wasn't as easy as it had been before. And that makes it hard on editors. And at a certain point, it was just like, yeah, you can get out of here. You can, you know, I was curious. I didn't, I decided I didn't want to stay there to the end. I wanted, I had a certain amount of time left, maybe, I don't know how many years. Um, I'm like, I've been around three quarters of the century. So I just wanted to know if there was a, a another stage and what it might be. And I sort of would be surprised if it involves much writing, because I've done that. I've sat at my desk for hours. I've had stayed up really late. I've missed all kinds of events, openings, memorial services, all these things I wish I had been to. You know, it might be my own fault for being a kind of slow writer, but I just want to be sort of to move through the art world more in a different way in a different way. That was one of the things I was thinking as I was preparing for our discussion is how it seems like you have probably spent a lot of time moving through the art world while having to keep people at an arm's distance. Yeah. I, I know that you have a group of friends like Lori Simmons that uh, are, that you're close to, but was it problematic during those years to try to figure out what level of relationship you can have with people and still maintain your integrity? Well, that's, you know, I'm, I've been very aware of that. I've never written about people like Lori that I was extra close to and whose relationships preceded my going to the Times or even to The Voice. And I think that as a writer, I mean, the, the Times sort of took care of that. They just said, you're not, these are the things we, we don't want you to do. Although there was plenty of writing about friends or acquaintances at the at the paper, but I just felt like this is the only thing I've got to go with is a certain kind of integrity, and I was fairly strict. You know, I went to I used to go to artist opening dinners, and then I stopped doing that, and um, so I feel like yeah, I, I I gave up all these things so that I could feel at ease doing criticism. And um, now I'm not gonna give them up so much. You know, I, I always, I mean, I knew a lot of people on an acquaintance social level, which means that we never went to each other's houses. Of course, Jerry and I don't entertain at all, so nobody came to our house, but but I, it didn't get that intimate. It was just like, I mean, my whole social life revolves around going to galleries anyway. So you would just see these people regularly and, you know, say hi, and then maybe have a short conversation and maybe a longer one. And it was fine. It seemed fine for a while, partly because so much of my time was taken up with writing, with seeing shows. And, uh, but I also think that psychologically, I wanted that kind of structure that I don't know if I'm shy or afraid or what, but that I prefer to keep people at a certain distance and to be pretty much with myself. And, you know, I mean, Jerry and I have been together since 86. And I started, I first published in 72. So, you know, I had done some writing, but really I've been with him for the majority of my writing life. And so I've had company. And I've had this kind of live in, uh, you know, sounding, whatever it's called. Sounding board? Or... Sounding, yeah. like, And and he he as well. It's just so weird. I, I mean, I know, like, I don't, I'm not going to write memoirs about being drunk at, you know, CBGBs or <laughs> uh, the Odeon. It just didn't happen. It's, 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 it's adult life. I mean, Jerry, you may have done this. Um, Jerry... I always read the obits, and I love New York Times obits. It's the first thing I look for. But one time there was an uh, obituary of of this man named Al Davis, who is this very famous football coach and was sort of known for 
being that way and concentrating. And at the end of the obit, they quoted him saying, I live a tunnel life. I'm not really part of society. And that was such a kind of heart. For, it was just kind of heartbreaking for this guy to understand. That's what, and I think that for some people, that's what you have to do. You know, if you're going to, it does take your life. You know, I, I, I felt, and Jerry, so Jerry to some extent feels that as well, but he's much more sociable, much more social than I am. And, and he can talk to anybody and, He's always come back, coming back and telling me about conversations he had on planes with various MAGA types, you know. <laughs> no arguments, just sort of talking. He's a provocateur. Yeah, but some of those, sometimes people don't even know they're being provoked. But yeah, he's very good at that. So, you, you know, you're, you're piquing my interest. Have you given thought to what you want to do with this time? I mean, other than moving through the world in, in a different way, have you have you ever thought about making? No, I was You've done never, so much looking. I was never an artist. I didn't have the hands for it, and I didn't have the patience. I didn't really have the... I mean, I made a fair amount of art in college, but I knew I didn't... Once I got to New York and read, knew a little bit about art and knew Judd, I knew I didn't have the consciousness for it, that making art was a form of of uh, therapy, that I was blank when I was making art, and I really had no idea what I was doing. And I couldn't even look at it very well. I knew it wasn't very good, but you know, I couldn't have figured out how to fix it. So that was that was never on the table. I just don't know what is, you know? I mean, sometimes I think I might get together with a friend of mine and we start this weird little gallery where we show stuff we, we really love and uh, see how that goes. But I don't, I don't think it would go very far in this economic climate. And then sometimes I think, well, I'm just going to run off and work in a dog rescue shelter, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, time for something completely different. So, right. But we might travel now if I can ever get my uh, passport, and uh, which I lost somewhere in this office. It's it's probably hidden in one of the sixty thousand books. I in your know. Home, right? I'm so. I mean, Jerry just accepted it and went and got his, replaced it. I keep thinking this has got to show up. You know, two years, three years later. Um, but it's very strange right now. I feel like I'm very much in free fall. I'm not used to not having the time sort of determining my schedule and how I'm using my time. I'm doing a little bit of writing for them and it's still really hard. So I'm thinking, well, maybe this was a mistake. <laughs> you know, maybe, you, maybe you should like go off the drug completely, but I'm, I'm glad to keep my hand in just in terms of skill and stuff like that. You know, last year I had Carol Dunham on the podcast and in preparation for my talk with Carol, I uh, came across this little film that uh, was a studio visit of yours with Carol. Mm -hmm. It was really insightful. It really helped me kind of get to uh, some of the things that are kind of interesting about the way he thinks about his work versus the way the rest of the world thinks about his work. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, like, do you do many uh, studio visits like that? Or is that, you know, something that was specific to Lori and Carol being friends? And I, went to, I go to studios of the people I don't, I, I'm not going to be writing about, at least during my tenure at the paper, you know? Right. And so that was, and that was a film that Michael Blackwood did. I've never seen it. Um, in fact, I think I'll never see a film I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> you are in the process of being filmed, right, Roberta? Right. Made, what, what is it, uh, The House That Art Built? Am I getting the title that, or the, the working art, title the house right? House That Criticism Built. House That Criticism Built. I know we're still in the process there, but what is that project? Well, that's a project that Jerry and the filmmaker cooked up and then have repeatedly dragged me into, if you... If you... <laughs> <laughs> you want my deep down emotional reaction. I mean, I just, you know, I still have my COVID weight. 
if I'm lucky, I'm going to be a little thinner at the end of the film than at the beginning. But it's just like, this could not be happening at a worse time. And, you know, we've done a few things together and it seems to be going okay. And then Jerry and Allison cook up something else. And, uh, and finally, I'm just like relaxed about it. I'm not going to, I used to give them so much trouble that it was really not, uh, not productive and not, and not, uh, I didn't express what might have been a certain expected level of gratitude. But it's been, it's been kind of a horror show <laughs> for me. <laughs> <laughs> like I see, they send out photographs of, of stuff happening. You can't even say it's on the set. There's never any set. They're just here or in Chelsea or at the Met or whatever. And um, I don't think I'm going to see it. I just, I would just be on the floor rolling around and cringing and howling. We'll see. I mean, right. living with Jerry is full of surprises. Oh, I bet. You know, I, w I was thinking the other day in terms of trying to look back uh, on, on your life. And I think about what we remember and what we don't. You know, I, I have this theory that the things we remember are our rituals, the thing that we would do all the time in the extraordinary, the things that were out of place. And so when you when you look back over the last 40, 45, 50 years, what stands out? Because I mean, 4,500 essays. 42. What do you remember? What, what stands out? Well... First of all, some of those are really short reviews. So the number, is, in my mind, that number seems inflated, but they're counting sort of the number of bylines. That's how they do it. They don't they don't consider length, I don't think. Well, mostly art stands out. And not much else does, like the pain of meeting a deadline. I, I always am sure I can write the next thing. Um, and maybe that's just as well. I mean... I think part of being a weekly critic is that you're always looking ahead. That you're on, you know, <clears throat> you you meet a deadline, you know what's up next, and you start progressing toward that, like calling the museum, getting in to see the show, going to the gallery, having photographs sent. So you you just, it's impossible not to keep going forward. And it was also possible never to go back and read your own work, which is also... I've never gone back very, very seldom. And then sometimes I'm like pleasantly surprised and sometimes I'm horrified. That's just a sense like Jerry is a walking, talking archive. You know, he sort of knows everything he's written. And um, but I can't do that because partly because there's been so much. And people, you know, people will say I reviewed a show and or else I'll say, I wonder if I ever reviewed this person. You know, I'm writing on an artist. I wonder if I reviewed him or her earlier. But I think that's, you know, I think I probably have a real, like looking at the film, I have a real horror of going back. And I think that's probably basic to going forward, at least for me, or probably compliments going forward. You know, you, you talk about uh, never going back you know, you wrote an article, was it last year, uh, you know, about changing your mind about Cecily Brown. Right. Like, did, had you recalled exactly what you had said the first time around? Like, did you remember that? Or did did somebody have to remind you? Or did you did you go back and reread it, given the fact that, you know, th this new opportunity had come up? Well, I think I did go back and reread it, but I can't swear to it. Um I just, you know, I had a certain certain expectation of not liking the show because I'd written about two of her shows negatively and there'd been a kind of, I thought, a, a bit of a brouhaha in the art world. Right. The form of which I cannot remember. It's just like, you know, a lot of people were not happy. So I just walked in. I was assigned to that show. It was not a show I chose. So I walked in with very low expectations and it just, you know, I was just really interested in looking at the paintings in a way that I had not been before. 
And I think that's probably a compliment of a combination of my growth and hers. Because I do think she's gotten a lot better as an artist. And um, it was just very strange. Like, I got to the back of the show and I'm thinking, Jesus, <laughs> this is much more interesting than I remembered. And I don't know, if, you know, there was a whole career there. So there were works on paper and tentative attempts at things and things in pencil, big paintings, middle-sized paintings. And it wasn't, strictly speaking, a retrospective. I can't remember. Maybe it was more than I think, but it had a lot of new work in it. So I've never really <clears throat> had that happen before. You know, usually you kind of hedge it, you know, like you say, well, this is this. Well, like saying she's grown as an artist is hedging it. But I haven't had that happen a lot. I'll have. And I think that, again, you're talking about the recent work of an artist. I, I could go back there and look at the earlier work and have just as many problems. But um what you realize when you see a survey like that is that there was a place where the artist was headed that you couldn't see. You know that she, that that she had her she had her own ideas and there was a development in them that you could not see. And you know I think it takes really a long time to be a good painter. And I think we're you know in the American art world, we're used to like Frank Stella coming along and just kind of knocking everything out of the box at 29, which actually didn't do him much good. Um, and again and again, I'm struck with how long it takes uh, maybe female painters a longer time. Well, why is that? I mean, can we make assumptions that it's just been, I mean, obviously there's a period where female painters were judged in a different way, is the is the opportunity ripe for uh, female painters to to ascend more quickly now than in the past? Maybe, although I think that there are as many female painters as male painters who are ascending too fast. You know, I just think it might have taken women, and maybe it's you know, women have different demands on their time. If you decide not to have children, that's one thing. But if you're going to have them. That's another thing. And I do think that regardless of what, of how visible they seem these days, and it's very visible, they don't get the same rewards or considerations. Painting is really, really complicated. And making good paintings is much more complicated than a lot of people think. Even, I mean, I speak from my own example of my own experience of steam painting. It's, I feel like it's taken me a really long time, and I'm still I'm still learning, just to see the totality of what a painting is in terms of space, paint handling, and overall effect, and that's um, that's important. I think we did get this feeling that young artists would just come along, like Stella, Larry Poon, Schnabel, Sally. All these guys would just come along and and try to like stake their turf, and that was it. And it was very interesting to watch Stella's development. Like Stella just sort of became a regular artist again. You know, he wasn't, I mean, he's, he has his old reputation sort of following him around, following him around, but he wasn't, wasn't really an art star in the same way. He was just, okay, that's done. Let's get on with it. You know, he just was going series after series. And, uh, I mean, it's an amazing project to think about, even if you may not like the individual results. Roberta, I, I, I think I've taken up more time than I asked for. I, I really appreciate you, um, you know, sitting down and uh, allowing me to um, ask you about the past and you know, look towards the future. I, I, it's such an honor to, to get to spend the afternoon with you. Likewise. Maybe in a few years, I'll, I'll come back once I've figured out what's going to happen with this space. And we'll, we'll talk about your first gallery show okay. or uh, a dog shelter, whichever, yeah. whichever. Well, you know, dealers have always been my favorite people in the art world. I mean, they just, they're the ones that, like artists, are sort of doing the grunt work and taking, taking the big risks. So I, li I like them. Well, I, I, I think they like, uh, they like you too. 
that's something that I think is kind of interesting. I've I've heard you say before that you know you really can't trust an artist to understand what his work is saying. They don't. They don't have control over all the meaning. And the same thing. I I feel like I I don't know if you understand how revered and respected you are out there because you know you've got your head down in your writing, right? No, but, I never. Uh, that the art world loves you. Well, that. That's what Jerry always used to say. And I never believe him. I just think it was like his sick attachment to me. Um, <laughs> but when I when it was announced, Jerry and I both announced I was retiring on on our Instagrams, and it was it was so stunning the response. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. I I, I said to several people, "It's like my Sally Field moment. You know, you like me. You really, really like me." <laughs> and it was like the biggest going away gift, the best that you could have, because it sort of accounted for your achievement and sort of gave me a place to be now. You know, right. it was just I was just completely stunned. Again, uh, I'm very appreciative. I, I will let you get back to your your busy day of of doing nothing. <laughs> Get, get to some galleries, right? <laughs> yes. Doing nothing takes more time. Than That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to Art Sense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening.